Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon from Singapore and a very warm welcome to all of you to our panel discussion, Greening Tomorrow Today, Partnerships for Zero Carbon Shipping that we're co-hosting with the Royal Danish Embassy in Singapore and the Danish Maritime Authority. My name is Jui and I'm the CEO of SG Innovate. Uh, it is my honor uh, to open today's event alongside Her Excellency Sandra Jensen Landy, Ambassador of Denmark to Singapore. Furthermore, it is our great privilege to be joined by Mr. Dan Jorgensen, Denmark's Minister for Climate, Energy and Utilities, who will be sharing a keynote address with us via a video recording uh, a few moments uh, after Ambassador Landy's uh, opening address. Thank you, Minister, for this great honor. Uh, Ambassador Landy and I have done a couple of things together. Uh, we just did something on maritime innovation last month, and we're really happy to be doing this again, uh, co-presenting today's event uh, as a follow-up, both as a follow-up to last month's event, as well as in conjunction with the Singapore Maritime Week 2021, which is taking place this week. For those of you who are not familiar with SG Innovate, uh, we are a company wholly owned by the Singapore government whose mandate is to develop the deep tech ecosystem. And we do this in a few ways. We do this by investing in deep tech startups. Uh, we do this by developing and placing talent. And we do this by bringing people together like we're doing today, um, especially for a cause as important as the planet's health. We need to beat the drum for it uh, by educating people and by raising awareness. Of course, we also hope that discussions like today's can seed collaborations that serve as precursors to eventual action. Shipping, as you know, is responsible for 80% of the world's trade volume. It currently accounts for 2 to 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but left unattended, this number will rise to about 10% by 2050. In order to unlock the benefits of decarbonization in hard to abate sectors like shipping, players across the entire maritime value chain and across political boundaries need to find a way to work together. Singapore and Denmark have both been strong advocates against climate change. Uh, Denmark, as you know, has been both a pioneer and leader in the sustainability movement. Uh, Denmark's targeting carbon neutrality by 2050 with an intermediate goal of 70% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030. Singapore has also ramped up its green agenda. Last month, the Singapore Green Plan 2030 was launched and earlier this week, the Maritime Singapore Decarbonization Blueprint 2050 was announced by our Transport Minister, Ong Yi Kang, spearheaded by the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, MPA for short. It is probably the most comprehensive initiative launched in Singapore to date that is aimed at uh, decarbonizing the shipping industry. Included in this initiative are plans for a digital port at SG, uh, just-in-time planning and coordination platform for port stakeholders, as well as a global maritime decarbonization center, which will serve as a coordinating center for R&D projects, one of which I'm given to understand is a trial by Shell to use hydrogen fuel cells uh, for ships, the first experiment of its kind in Singapore. Sorry, I thought I was muted <laughs> I hope uh, Lei Hoon, Chief Executive of MPA, can tell us a little more about these developments later. Um, so I'm really glad that in today's event, we will explore how both Singapore and Denmark can collaborate and learn from each other to realize emissions-free shipping. More critically, how we can unlock opportunities for greater international public-private collaboration, which is ultimately the objective of our gathering today. I'd like, as always, to take this opportunity to express my deep appreciation uh, to our partners, the Royal Danish Embassy in Singapore, with whom we have had a long, warm, and productive relationship, and the Danish Maritime Authority. We look forward to many more fruitful collaborations in the years to come. Um, my deepest appreciation as well to all our esteemed panelists for taking time off your very busy schedules to share your insights with us this afternoon. And last but not least, thank you to our audience for tuning in. We hope this session will turn you into soldiers for a movement that will make our planet a better place. And uh, without further ado now, uh, please allow me to invite the ambassador to say a few words. Ambassador Landy, please. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Lim. I agree with everything you said, not least uh, that ultimately we are here to turn our words into action. So thank you so much for that inspirational uh, start. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work with you and your colleagues at SG Innovate. It's a partnership uh, we appreciate very, very much here at the embassy. Ladies, uh, gentlemen, esteemed panelists, uh, welcome to this uh, discussion uh, here from me on behalf of the, the Royal Danish Embassy in, in Singapore. I have been looking so much forward to this event. There is no doubt that decarbonization, uh, the agenda is uh, picking up steam. And I can't wait to hear what all our excellent panelists have to say about it today. Uh, in this uh, Singapore Maritime Week, we have heard a lot about the decarbonization the last few days, even in events that had nothing to do with decarbonization. And I think that is uh, a sign of how important and how pertinent this agenda is. So thank, uh, thank you for, for everyone who has taken part already uh, in this, the debate these past few days and have, are helping to raise uh, focus on this agenda. Needless to say, uh, maritime decarbonization is a part of a larger energy discussion. We are looking for ways to transform the way we produce and use energy across the board uh, in all parts of our society. But there's also no doubt that the maritime uh, decarbonization process is more challenging than many other areas. It is simply easier to see how we can electrify our vehicles, or put solar panels on our buildings, then it is to see how can we decarbonize and find green fuels that can ensure transport over long distances of goods and people. So that's a challenge, but it's also a unique opportunity. So if we can solve decarbonization in the maritime sector, we can solve a lot of challenges at the same time, not least in aviation as well, for example. So I think of it as a, as a Sinatra, New York, New York uh, approach. If we make it here, we can make it anywhere. So that I think is, is even more reason to look at that, at this agenda. It's also clear that there are no easy solutions. We simply have to find new ones. Um, as was highlighted in, in several of the opening speech, uh, speeches on Monday in Singapore Maritime Week, we need to be explorative and we need to do this in partnership. So that's why we are so happy today to have a, an event around partnerships. It's a strong lineup we have here from maritime uh, community in both uh, Denmark and Singapore. And the maritime time ties between our two countries, uh, they are old, they are long, and they are strong. So that's a good basis for partnership. We are, we are close partners and, and both countries are committed uh, to green transition and to sustainable development of the maritime sector as, as Dr. Lim said uh, initially. And now seems to be the right time for this discussion. The headlines, as I said, uh, have been piling up, not least as part of Singapore Maritime Week, but also all over the news this past week. We saw uh, the report from the International Advisory Panel on Maritime Decarbonization with nine pathways to maritime uh, decarbonization. Yeah. And we received exciting announcements of a new uh, decarbonization center here in Singapore. We also saw a, a critical report from the World Bank on uh, LNG, whether that's a worthy maritime transition fuel or not. It, the report argued that we should switch directly to green hydrogen and green ammonia instead. So that's an interesting uh, uh, point of view. The American special uh, presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, he announced that the US uh, wants IMO to adopt zero emission targets on full decarbonization. And the UK also set new targets. And to top it up, actually right now, our prime ministers are discussing uh, energy transitions, climate action as part of President Biden's leader summit on climate. So all in all, it's been an exciting week for decarbonization agenda. And I have to admit, I haven't caught up with all the details under all these headlines. So I am so much looking forward to hearing what our panelists have to say on all of these developments. Um, so as I said, I think it's a timely, it's an important discussion. There should be no doubt that this is a priority for the Danish government. Climate action in general, green energy transition in particular, these are central priorities. And to underscore that, I am very happy to be able to give the word to the Danish Minister on Climate, Energy and Utilities, Mr. Dan Jørgensen, who will share his keynote uh, remarks on Denmark's ab ambitions and our strategies on maritime decarbonization. Thank you.
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at this important event. Shipping is the backbone of international trade. It transports 90% of all world trade and is already a very climate efficient mode of transport compared to other modes of transportation. Still, international shipping accounts for between 2 and 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions today and it is expected to grow with more than 50% over the next 30 years. The solution to this challenge is of course not to end shipping as an industry. Without shipping, intercontinental trade, the bulk transport of raw materials and the import-export of affordable food and manufactured goods would simply not be possible. Instead, green shipping becomes a must-win battle. Shipping is a hard to abate sector and it will require international collaboration across sectors to reach international climate goals set in the Paris Agreement and the IMO's initial GHG strategy. Denmark is an international maritime nation and has been one for centuries. We believe it is our responsibility to promote international zero carbon shipping. For that reason, the Kingdom of Denmark actively supported the ban of heavy fuel oil in the IMO. Working through IMO is important, but not the only way to accelerate transformation. Denmark facilitated the Getting to Zero Coalition for the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019. The coalition consists of more than 150 private sector actors collaborating across sectors and the entire shipping value chain. They collaborate to develop CO2 neutral and commercially viable vessels by 2030 and carbon neutrality in shipping by 2050. I'm pleased to see that Maersk has announced an ambition to launch its first zero emission vessel already in 2023. Last year, Denmark initiated the work on a zero emission shipping mission under the International Forum Mission Innovation. The mission will promote activities that drive innovation forward across the value chain from fuel production via ports to ships. The mission shares the aim of the Getting to Zero Coalition and will facilitate closer collaboration and partnerships between public and private stakeholders. It is co-led by the US, the Global Maritime Forum and the Mask McKinney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping. Several more countries are participating and more are considering joining. The mission is set for launch at the Mission Innovation Ministerial in early June this year. We see today that discussions on policy, technology and investments are advancing across the hard to abate sectors at a speed and a scale hard to imagine just a few years ago. Shipping is at the forefront of this change. New technologies like Power2X will give us an opportunity to decarbonize both shipping, aviation and heavy transport as well as other hard-to-abate sectors by developing alternative green fuels. It is a daunting task, which, in addition to the deep-sea vessels, requires infrastructure for scalable zero-carbon energy sources, including production, distribution, storage and bunkering across the international trade routes. But first, we will need plentiful supplies of electricity from renewables to develop green hydrogen for the green fuel production. Investments in green hydrogen is not just an investment in technology. It is an investment in the future and in future generations. Therefore, it is a key priority for Denmark to meet this demand. Denmark is building the world's first so-called energy islands. The energy islands will distribute power from several new offshore wind farms to millions of European households. The energy island in the North Sea alone will eventually have a capacity of 10 gigawatts that is enough to meet the electricity demand of about 10 million European households. The abundance of wind energy will also be used to produce sustainable fuels for shipping, aviation and other hard to abate sectors. Greening international shipping is a challenge, but it can be done. Through international public-private collaboration, we will decarbonize the shipping sector. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, 
to the minister for these uh, clear works and a very strong commitment uh, to the agenda. This will be done, <laughs> as he said. He also said, uh, we cannot live without shipping. Decarbonization of the maritime sector is a must win battle. So now the question is, how do we do that? And I'm very grateful that I'm not supposed to answer that question, but that we have an excellent lineup of panelists who can give some answers to that. And to steer us through that uh, discussion, we have with us uh, Ms. Esther Chang. She's the executive director for the Global Compact Network in Singapore, which is the local chapter of the UN Global Compact uh, Network. It's a leading voice on corporate sustainability and a driver for action on ensuring a more sustainable future. So in other, in other words, we are in good hands. So let me, let me give the word to you, Esther, uh, so you can introduce the panelists and take us through this interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Landy, and a very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, for those of you who might not be aware today, it happens to be Global Earth Day. So it indeed is very appropriate this, uh, for us to be having this uh, conversation today. And earlier this week at the opening ceremony, decarbonization was a top response. So 43% to be exact on, on what is the biggest challenge facing the maritime community. And this topic has been a central theme throughout the conference. We will be unpacking this a little bit later on. Though geographically far apart, Singapore and Denmark have a long-standing bilateral relationship and have much in common. The two nations have strong maritime histories. So it comes as no surprise that we aligned on many issues, including the urgency to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The maritime sector must drastically cut its emissions if the Paris Agreement targets are to be met. The IMO has set a goal to reduce emissions from shipping by at least 40% by 2030 and 70% by 2050. So over the next 45 minutes, uh, we will hear from our esteemed panelists on the drivers, barriers, and catalysts to decarbonize shipping. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our speakers. We have Ms. Kwale Hung, Chief Executive of Singapore Maritime and Port Authority, Mr. Andreas Norset, Director General of the Danish Maritime Authority, Dr. Bo Serap Simonson, CEO of Maersk McKinney Moller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping, and finally, Mr. Andreas Soman Pau, Chairman of BW Group. So we have two Andreas here with us today. So I will be addressing them as Andreas N or and Andreas S. So let me kick off the conversation by looking at the pressures that's facing uh, that's being faced by the private sector. So on Andrea Andrea S. What has been the drivers for BW to decarbonize? Can you share with us about um, you know, some of the journeys or perhaps a key strategy the company has taken thus far? Yeah, so in terms of pressures specifically, I suppose um, you know, regulatory pressure is always the strongest force and we see a lot of regulatory change coming and I think that that's healthy for the industry um, and whether that's in the form of um, new legislation or, or increased cost levies, these sorts of things. Um, it sort of prompts the industry to respond. The other major force is the social one. And those of you who were listening in on the Marine Money Conference earlier this week may have heard me talk about how I feel we're at a societal turning point in terms of what's acceptable. Um, and that's, that's changing and it's going to affect how leaders uh, behave. So even if you think that business leaders are fundamentally economically minded creatures, um, we're also part of a network of friends and families and peers, and we want to do right by our communities and by society. So it's this, this sort of twin force of regulatory pressure, social pressure. But the last thing I would say, actually, it's also a positive opportunity. I mean, for businesses, one shouldn't always think defensively, oh, I'm under pressure, but how can I actually grasp some good business opportunities? Got it. So you got regulatory pressure, social pressure. A, a social force, business opportunity, and underpinning is leadership. Uh, so Lehum, it's been a very exciting week at Singapore Maritime Week, including announcement of a decarbonization in Singapore. So there are many initiatives, but uh, unfortunately we only have one hour today. So perhaps you can share a key initiative or direction we can expect from Maritime Singapore. 
Um, thanks, Esther. If you could give me time, I'll just say two. Um, essentially, I think for Singapore, because of the IMO target of 2050, uh, we've set up the International Advisory Panel and which uh, Andres S here is one of our co-chairs. So I think yesterday, it was a very eventful day where we actually set up the announcements of mm. the steps that we are taking towards. So the first key is really to set up a decarbonization centre. And we, uh, it's a recommendation that came from our International Advisory Panel. And we think that there is a role that can be played, bringing different stakeholders together along the value chain ecosystem and more importantly to have a private public partnership to form joint industry collaborations so i think this is a very exciting part for us because we are looking at um, at the same time how do we tie up with other decarbonization centers like um, the MERS center here uh, where bo is uh, represented in terms of how do we collaborate so that we can snowball um, some of the findings some of the commercial ideas and what we need is a globally, commercially um, uh, feasible uh, solutions that can take place within the next five, if not 10 years. So that's one. Secondly, uh, within Singapore, for our domestic hovercraft, as well as our port, as well as our contributions to the international, uh, on the international front, we are coming up with a Maritime Singapore Decarbonization Blueprint 2050. And with that, we've launched a series of uh, industry consultation. So we'll be taking in the recommendations from the International Advisory Panel and looking at how to build that further to come up with concrete plans to move uh, Singapore as, and our role in the global com shipping community forward uh, in the next few years. So that are some of the two key initiatives which we are quite excited about. Fantastic. Well, Andreas and uh, Denmark as a nation has set very ambitious climate targets, 70% emissions reduction by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050. So how is the maritime industry contributing to this national effort? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Esther. Well, I think it contributes in, 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 in several ways. Right now, when we talk about international shipping, it's actually still discussed if it's part of the equation on the 70% and the carbon neutrality in 2050, mm. because everybody realizes that international shipping face a, com a global com competition, so it has to sort of go hand in hand. But I would say, uh, being a proud Dane here, I'm very proud that actually we do have companies, not least Maersk, uh, but, but also other companies that have really tried, and they're still trying very hard to push forward and really uh, deliver. So I'm, I'm quite confident that in a few years, uh, in particular, when we see carbon, uh, carbon free ships in 2023, and in the years that that moves after that, I think that we will see a, a, a lot of the shipping companies in the maritime sector such that they will actually deliver and, and become much more carbon friendly than, than we anticipate today. Looking at the domestic side, uh, we already see a lot of initiatives, sort of battery driven ferries, and uh, they're also going to experiment with new fuel types. So I'm, I'm, I have, a, I would say, a realistic vision that in, in, in quite a few years, actually, I think that we will, we will start to see uh, domestic uh, maritime transport, in particular the ferries, that they will become uh, very close to uh, carbon neutral. So the maritime sector will, will definitely move. And one thing that, I, that, that we should not forget when we talk about the maritime sector, that it's not only about shipping companies, but it's very much also about the te technology providers, mm -hmm. shipyards, but also engine manufacturers and, and, and all kinds of uh, equipment manufacturers. And, and, and we should not forget to have them as part of the equation and be a very close dialogue with them because they can actually deliver a lot of solutions. And I, we have a lot of these companies in Denmark and we are in a very close uh, dialogue with them. And, and I think that we will, we, will, we will see new technology coming into the market that will also help paving the way for carbon neutrality. Thank you, Andres. Well, that set me up nicely for a question for Bo. Uh, the Center for Zero Carbon Shipping works with in leading industry players and across different supply chain on the decarbonizing decarbonization technologies and solutions. So perhaps you can share with us what are some of the biggest challenges that you see the industry is facing and highlight some key initiatives that's attempting to solve these issues. Thank you very much, um, Esther. And, and I think this, uh, this lines up perfectly what was said with my uh, fellow panelists here up until uh, this point. I think uh, we are basically working with a challenge, you, you call it a challenge. We're basically working with a challenge to understand the bigger picture. Shipping is huge, but shipping is a part of the bigger picture. And we need to see uh, shipping 
in the transition of an even larger of a context that is now attempting to transition into a new sustainable uh, societal system, sustainable business system. And it's in that context, we need to be able to explain how is shipping playing its part in that. Uh, so that's the one challenge. And that's really about, it is of course about how do we produce the fuels and the energies and what are the technologies. It's also about uh, how do we set up good objectives? How do we measure progress? It's about understanding the levers for this change. And the levers are certainly, like we heard uh, previously, regulatory and policy. It's uh, certainly uh, social uh, pressure, which basically marinates, you can say, the whole supply chain in a, in a drive for, for decarbonizing and greening the supply chain. So we're seeing the commercial pressure now also building up. Um, and uh, of course, we're seeing also on the financial side, a lot of new things uh, being, being put forward. You know, so, so it's not like one challenge. We're not thinking about this as finding the silver bullet. It's first of all about understanding that bigger system. And then from that, understanding how can we make that change? And we truly believe we can. Uh, but there are some risks and some development gaps in that. And, and that understanding we will then use to uh, identify a number of projects uh, that, that should be set in motion in order to de-risk uh, that transition. And, and you asked for challenges. And, and some of those challenges are related to technology development. We need to mature next generation electrolyzers and fuel cells and engines and, and what you have you. We need a good uh, policy and regulation in place, uh, etc. So I think uh, that's uh, that's the short answer to that. It's uh, it's on two levels. It's the big picture, and then it's all the solutions we need to bring in place. Thanks, Bo. Andreas S. I was wondering if you'd like to add on to that from BF uh, BS is uh, BW's perspective. Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, Bo, Bo sort of said it, uh, that we, we need to tackle lots of um, specific solutions and try lots of things. I mean, you know, different companies have different uh, appetite for trialing. They have different balance sheets. And so we also have to be cognizant that not everybody can do everything, but one should do what one can within, uh, within one's power. One of the questions I've been asked quite a lot this week in different forums is, you know, how, how do small companies and big companies cope with, or how do small companies cope with this? The big companies will kind of take care of themselves. And I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, clearly smaller companies might face challenges in terms of access to financing, and we should help them with that. Um, it's also true, small companies may not be best placed to take on the big infrastructure challenges. Um, so when the minister talked about the Danish energy islands and so on, it tends to be the big companies that are getting behind that. But small companies can participate in numerous other opportunities and challenges. So I'll give you some examples. You know, small consulting firms can help with carbon accounting and with academic thinking around what we should be measuring. Startups can help with new technologies, as they've done in so many other industries. Um, small craft owners can help to pilot um, and trial new solutions. Um, it doesn't only have to be the big vessel owners. Um, so I think that, you know, everybody has something that they can do in this. The last point I would make is, you know, big companies may have the resources to take on big challenges, but they are not going to have it easy either because they have huge legacy assets that they need to deal with. So, you know, as with many industry transitions of the past, if you go in with a heavy burden on your shoulder, lots of assets, you know, you're not going to have an easy ride either. Um, so, that, you know, everybody has their, their own uh, cross to bear and issues to address, opportunities to grasp. What, what you've highlighted here um, is certainly not unique to, to uh, shipping. I think we hear a global compact from companies across different sectors, industries, and we work across uh, companies of all sizes, right? Well, the end goal may very much be the same. What we recognize that the pathways quite often differ because the challenges of the big and smaller companies are quite different. Um, so perhaps Lei uh, if I may ask you, you know, Andreas have mentioned some of the challenges he highlighted for the, for the big folks, but also for the um, 
smaller uh, ship owners and operators. What are some of the uh, policies direction that uh, Maritime Singapore is providing to support the, um, the smaller companies in their transition? Maybe Esther, I will come from uh, perhaps uh, three, three, uh, three angles um, quickly. The first one is really that, uh, I mean, we, have, we are fortunate that we are actually building a new port uh, all from scratch, which is our Tuas port. Uh, where 60, it will handle 65 million, up to 65 million TUs of conta uh, containers uh, when ready in the 2040s. Now, in the build up to it, there are actually opportunities, for example, to work with our smaller and medium enterprises to bring them along in this decarbonization journey. So I think we are not just talking about shipping, we're also talking about port infrastructure. And in the port infrastructure field, whether it's about LNG fuel prime movers, hydrogen fuel cell, AGVs, electrified type of uh, container handling equipment, these are areas that we can bring along the companies as well. So that's what PSA and Jurong Port are, uh, are working on. Now, besides the port infrastructure, then we are talking about bunkering. Now, on the bunkering side, the infrastructure must be ready as well. And in Singapore, we've got many SMEs who are involved in the bunkering sector. So, for example, when we go into LNG bunkering um, in a big wave this year, we actually got um, our companies along and involved. We actually provide funds, for example, to co-fund uh, LNG bunker tankers so that they can bring it in along um, and, and also do ship-to-ship uh, -ship bunker um, in Singapore. So that's the second. Now, third, um, I think it's also about two aspects, whether in terms of financial schemes, we can bring them along, demand um, generation from the larger companies. Uh, these are potential areas we can work on. Um, we actually, since um, for the past couple of uh, weeks, when all this decarbonization uh, talk that we have, uh, announcements that we've been making uh, in Singapore, we've even got companies um, that has approached us uh, from a capital fund perspective on that they actually want to fund. SMEs with a lower ROI and they are crowdsourcing for a certain amount of money which they can go out to the SMEs and we are very encouraged with that. So we are prepared to partner uh, with uh, fundraisers, uh, even banks, we can reach out to them to see how we can work on the green finance part. Fantastic. Uh, Andres and um, do you have more to add to that and give us some perspectives from, um, from the Denmark? I would say that uh, that uh, uh, Andreas S. Uh, I think pointed to uh, something that we should not forget. That I think that a characteristic in the maritime domain is that it's very often small, medium-sized companies. I think the average uh, ownership is about seven to nine ships per company. Um, the big companies don't have uh, the organizational uh, challenges in moving ahead in, in in development projects, but we definitely see that in small, medium-sized companies. And an and anecdote on that is actually, I would say, 10 years ago, uh, we had a dialogue in, 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 in a, a development team, and we found out that uh, if a ship used what was what is called frequency-controlled fuel pumps, you, you would save 7% fuel, everything being equal. And what was interesting was that no small, medium-sized companies went into this, and I found out that they very often, they, they simply, they are not... They are not organized, they are not capable of running development projects that is sort of out of the scope of the day-to-day -day business. So we have tried in Denmark, and, and I think that's, that's something that we should consider when we make these partnerships moving forward, that we should strengthen, uh, when, when we have already tried that in Denmark, that to facilitate uh, helping companies, not only on the financial side, but simply also on how do you actually establish a development project because you, we're talking about companies that are they, they, they're totally occupied with the, running the day-to-day -day business. They, they do have a keen interest, and I think that interest will be much larger in the future to actually green their, 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 their shipping, but they are not capable of establishing the necessary development projects. And I think I, I don't want to interrupt your flow, uh, <laughs> Esther, on this, but you encouraged us before the session to ask each other questions. Yes. You know, I'd, I'd love to actually hear how in Denmark, um, either from Andreas and or, or from Bo, how in Denmark do you go about co-funding projects and, and smaller companies and so on to help them do that? Because that's clearly something that we also have in mind, which is we want to facilitate transition and we want to deploy funds towards helping you know, people in the ecosystem. So, so how are you all doing that? Sorry, Esther, to, <laughs> to jump in here. No, no, this is meant to be a dialogue. I like it. Okay. Would you like to comment first, Andreas? Or, uh, 
Would you like me uh, to? You, you, you start a long uh, bow. Uh, I'll chip in after. Yeah. Fully agree to, to what has been said here about uh, sort of the tail of uh, shipping. That is uh, actually where the biggest emissions are. So this is surely important to, to think about. And I think from our perspective, from the center perspective, we are working uh, with very large uh, companies that have the kind of capabilities that you were alluding to. But we are also working with the idea that we need to embrace uh, the tail. So, so we are certainly going to work in a very open manner to make uh, open invitations to join in, uh, even with very small resources, to be part, to be part of this on, on different levels, to be able to join just to get an understanding of the bigger picture I talked about before and maybe engage in some projects. And, and we would also like to help supporting the development or the facilitate basically that we set up development projects where we share the knowledge, we share the risk, um, we share the learnings and so on. So I think there's, there's actually a very uh, important role uh, in, in doing that so that it doesn't become a few front runners that, that are basically setting the agenda and then all of a sudden the rest uh, get regulation that puts them in, in a certain place. We certainly need this ongoing open discussion about what is going on, what are the opportunities, what do we see emerging. And, and I really think the way of doing that is, is be, to be transparent, to put things out in the open and, uh, and invite uh, openly in. And like you said, some small companies have a difficulty in doing that, but some small companies also work together, for example, with large uh, ship managers where you can, where there are effective channels of actually sharing, knowledges, uh, sharing knowledge and so on. So, so I think we, we can find a way of, of embracing uh, the tail also. That's, is, there, uh, is there a pool of funds available from the government or from the pi private sector to help, help people? Or is it more the insights and knowledge that you're referring to? There are pools available, but they're not sort of earmarked for, for small shipping companies or, or small companies as such. So it's really up to the ecosystem to come up with the projects and the activities and, and seek for the funding. But yeah. So uh, yeah, but, but yeah. But, but I think it happens. Uh, it happens naturally, and I, I see also industry organizations uh, stepping up to help really facilitate this uh, dialogue to get, to get also smaller companies on board in, uh, in this transition. And I really think they have a very important role uh, in, in doing that. Yeah, that was one of our ideas, it. by the way, behind you know, the center. You know, clearly, you, you, you started uh, before, beforehand. Um, but the idea that we can be a, a sort of centralizing node and a catalyst and bring together different parties, because otherwise everybody has to work very hard to find each other. And especially for smaller companies, like you were saying, Andreas, you know, they have their day-to-day -day business to run. It's hard for them to go out and explore what's happening. So a center can sort of bring, bring people together. Exactly. And if I may say, because I think you raised also an important thing that there will be a concern moving ahead now, and that is the direct financial support and being a small open economy, we are sort of as a principle against direct financial support. That means support. That means no company should be able to come to the government and say, okay, now we're going to make a retrofit, please give us X number of, of millions. So we don't, we don't have that kind of funding in, in, in Denmark, uh, but, but only if you are sort of testing new technology, then you can have uh, research development support in testing. We have had a, a few, for instance, LNG, we had a ferry in the, in the northern part of Denmark that had a huge donation from both the government and, and European Commission. Uh, I think it was 10 million euros in, in order to test new systems. But if it's only a matter of taking on board new technology, then, then you have to find the financial issues yourself. But where we can help is that, as you said, also the decarbonization center you're making in Singapore probably maybe also will enter into that is to help defining, analyzing, uh, and, and, and sort of running the project that will transform a ship or a company into uh, to something else, yeah. Is, is there a category, I'm, I'm so sorry, this is my last question, Esther, and I will stop interrupting, but is there a category where actually governments can fund? Because clearly you don't want to be helping companies with commercial benefits and basically, you know, putting profits in, in their, 
you know, bank accounts with government money, um, but you are willing to help on trials and pilots. Is there a middle bucket where there's clearly a commercial gap and a company can't make it commercially viable to retrofit or do something unless there is that kind of support? Is there a case for supporting in that case as part of the transition or does that get into very dangerous territory? <laughs> I think, to be honest, Andres, I think you're moving into dangerous uh, territory here. Uh, and, the, and I would say initially the answer would be no. But having said that, who knows what will happen in the future? That, that, that I think also will depend very much on what kind of push will come from industry as a whole and say maybe, uh, I mean, also we're talking market-based measures, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's something that can sort of pave the way. But again, as a principle, I think that we should be very careful not to see uh, acceptance of pouring direct financial support into owners because in you know even your competitors will all of a sudden in other countries maybe have uh, access to finance that will definitely distort the competition yeah i can see you're nodding so i i, I take that as a you, you well you i don't know i should let Lehun, <laughs> Lehun <laughs> wait in on this one i'm not a regulator <laughs> Um, okay, so Lehun here, maybe I just chip in. What uh, we found from experience for the past one, two years is this. I think firstly, if you're really talking about nascent type of technology that's not market ready, then some form of fund together with the research institutes would be helpful. So what we do is if you pair up a challenge statement together with a major, a big company who's able to provide the ship or the equipment, and at the same time, you tie up with a technology provider, there could be some hope there, right? That something may come out. So some sort of uh, initial start uh, funding will be helpful. But I think um, if we are now moving towards more market-ready type of technology, then I think the two initiatives, which is to have a joint industry project where people also see value as a type of investment can come in, uh, that actually is a very helpful model. The third is, I think when we look at, for example, rainmaking from Denmark, uh, I think when we were toying up with the idea, I remember it was over uh, a dinner at uh, an ambassador's place and uh, Michael was there. And we were talking about this idea of low carbon technology innovation. And he says, don't worry, rainmaking, we are coming in, 10 million will join in this initiative that you have. And they have been investing in low uh, technology. So I think there are actually pockets of funds out there who are willing to invest because there is a shift and people see some investment value at the end. So we probably need to just work a bit harder to bring such uh, 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 pockets of funds around, bring the organizations together and pair up so that uh, whatever risk that there is, is a shared risk whatever profitability or investment yield that can be obtained, we can even it out. Um, and lastly, that's our wish, is to bring in the banks and the private financing in. Um, we've got one interest in Singapore and we're quite excited about it. Um, and we hope that as well from our MOU with Tomasic that we can also bring Tomasic in. Although I shan't commit them further here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, for sparking this lively discussion. So perhaps if I can uh, just throw a question out. This is from the audience. Uh, Sunging Anand has asked, you know, cost is one thing, but another is accountability, right? We see companies making motherhood statements on ESG issues, but what can the industry do to hold stakeholders accountable to the decarbonization commitment they make? So uh, perhaps I throw this one first at Andreas. Yes. So I think you have to start by measuring uh, and reporting um, and doing it in as robust a way as you can, because otherwise it's correct that, you know, people can find ways around um, ways around the rules or find ways around their commitment. Um, there's a huge gray area. Take offsets. I mean, there are reports every day about offset schemes that are going a bit haywire you know, because um, a country says, we'll give you incentives to plant more trees. So what happens? They cut down all the trees and then they plant new ones to get the incentive and they've destroyed all the forest. Or you have schemes where people say, you know, we'll give you credits um, for this renewable project or to save this forest. And the problem is, you need to start understanding the motives and, and intentions. Was somebody actually going to cut down that forest in the first place? Was there a risk? Because if there wasn't, why are you getting credits for not cutting it down? Would that person have invested in that renewable project? Um, because if they would have done it anyway, they shouldn't get credits for doing it. 
And the moment we're into motives and intentions and feelings and what they would have done, what they wouldn't have done, this is a, a, a challenge. Um, so I think it's a good question to ask. How do we ensure that people do what they say they're going to do? How do we ensure the system works? And <clears throat> all we can start to do, I think, is just to be as robust as possible. I, I'll stop here, but actually at some point, I'd love to talk about how technology can play a role in this, um, because we talk a lot about new fuels and other things, but actually, uh, and we talk about digitalization as a concept, but there's actually a, an interesting marriage between technology and decarbonization. But let's, let's come back to that maybe later. For, for Andres uh, and, and, and Lehun, do you have um, any comments on this in terms of keeping companies accountable are they, you know, uh, doing what they are committed to do? Is there a role mm. that the regular re regulators can play here? Uh, perhaps I start with you, Andreas. And okay, um, uh, well, I, I think that uh, Andreas uh, is just, uh, I think, nailed it. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's it's absolutely important that we have robust, transparent uh, regulation and. Uh, and shipping in particular being so global as it is, I mean, it's uniquely global. It's global in, in its every DNA. Um, we need to have, a, in, in the end, the, the regulation we come up with needs to be enforced. And we saw it exactly the same on the sulfur issue where that has a huge economic impact. And, and, and very, very, very quickly it became clear that enforcement uh, is a very important factor in the equation to ensure that there will still be a, a level playing field and, and, and that everybody does what they're supposed to do. And I think that will be exactly the same on the greenhouse gas. So whatever regulation we come up with, uh, we need to have a transparent, robust and enforceable uh, rules and, 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 and a framework that we can, we can work with and ensure that everybody does what they're supposed to do and what they say they do. You know? Uh, to build on Andrew's end's point, um, you know, uh, um, uh, as the together with Global Compact Network Singapore and Singapore's Shipping Association, I thought the initiative to help our local maritime companies develop that capabilities in sustainability reporting (ESR) as part of ESR that you actually count in the carbon accounting and reporting that. For us, it was a helpful first step. At least when we reach out to the companies, there is a whole guidelines on how they can report on that. Then secondly, I think um, I do hope that um, companies themselves do see that there is a natural impetus for you to want to do that. Because as we were talking about earlier, as we move towards green financing and as you approach financial institutions, uh, for example, in Singapore, like DBS or OCBC, they will actually also naturally ask, you know, what is your company doing in terms of these areas? We've heard about Poseidon principles. What is your company doing and that could be a, a factor of consideration when you seek funding uh, from them and that naturally will actually bring this effort to a higher level so on, on that note I actually think that um, the pace perhaps can still go faster but I think the process has kick started ESR is such a big word among all the companies most companies around the world um, therefore if we can tilt the equation a little bit that it can also factor into your financing I think the momentum will actually go much faster Absolutely, and then we'll continue to work with uh, MPA and other partners to accelerate the uh, reporting space. And it's not just about reporting, but it's also looking at the quality on what people are reporting and the materiality. Um, good. So we, you know, maybe perhaps we can now pivot to talk about technology, since Andrea S had mentioned it. There's, I'll take a question uh, from uh, Michael Michael Green um, from the ESMI. So we see several solutions for green fuels, such as low sulfur, ammonia, hydrogen, LNG. These solutions can be adapted to existing vessels. The next generation of vessels have freedom, sorry, I just have freedom of the optimal propulsion and fuel source. Which fuel is the one for the future? Uh, I pass this to you, Bo. <laughs> That's a so-called really good question. Um, and uh, we all know that uh, nobody knows that. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's, the, that's the answer. Um, I think uh, we're looking and we will be looking at a multitude of fuels uh, in the future. And, and I, I believe uh, one, one of the reasons for that is that we can expect for many years to have more scarcity, if you will, of uh, renewable energies in this world compared to what we need. 
and we will have uh, these future fuels uh, being much more expensive also than the fossil uh, competitor, you know. So, so what we'll be seeing in the future, I believe, is a multitude of fuels where you take advantage of whatever uh, context, whatever synergies you can harvest with this, the region you are in, access to biomass, access to uh, different kinds of uh, existing uh, processes, and then you can produce fuels from that. That's at least what we are seeing at the moment. So that for, for a long time, we will actually see a multitude of fuels emerging um, and uh, to build the ship uh, for that kind of fuel, you need to think carefully about what are the multi-fuel capabilities that you want to be looking at uh, in the future. That would be my short answer to this. Um, and then we can dig into what are the, the five fuels that we think are the most feasible ones. But, but in my view, it'll, it's not, we're not talking about one fuel. Can I, can yeah. I chime in? So actually, um, when I mentioned technology earlier, I was talking about digital technology, which maybe we can come back to, but I'll try to stick on topic here about fuels. Um, you know, there was this report that came out from the World Bank recently, which said, you know, LNG is not the answer. And people have been asking, you know, so what, what do you think of this report? And, you know, what should we make of it? Um, you know, I think you can maybe boil it down to a couple of questions. Is, is LNG better than oil from a um, sort of CO2 GHG point of view? Um, most people say the answer is yes. There's some argument about methane and how long it stays in the atmosphere and, and leakage and so on. But fundamentally, it's, it's better than oil. Um, is there an alternative zero carbon fuel available today? No. So those who are saying that it's an improvement, it's a transition fuel, they're absolutely correct. Then you can ask the question, is it going to get us to net zero? Is it going to get us to a 50% reduction? No, it's not. So for those who are saying it's not good enough, they're also correct, right? So both camps are correct. And actually, I think it comes down to your philosophy. Are you someone who wants to wait for the perfect solution? Or are you someone who wants to do what you can do today, even if it's not the perfect solution? And I'm not here to judge people in either camp. I think it's a personal choice that companies and individuals have to make. Myself, I'm a pragmatist, and I think we should do all the little things we can. Uh, you know, maybe we can't supersize it because, you know, there's a risk if you go all LNG propulsion, there's a risk that, but, you know, take steps here and there while you're working on other things. The last thing on this is I think if we're too categorical uh, and we won't accept anything less than perfect, well, then we should not be buying electric vehicles. We should not be putting in solar panels because they're not perfect. They consume resources. They create disposal issues. You know, they have all kinds of questions about life cycle, cost and everything else. We don't have, you know, lots of perfect solutions. So we have to work with what we have. Thank you. Others want to chime in? Lehun here. If I could yes. just build on, you know, the... Uh, sorry. Lehun, please. Okay. Um, to answer the question, do we do today even if it's not perfect? Yes. So for Singapore, we take a stand. It may not be perfect, but we do it. LNG bunkering, we are ready. Um, just to add from a bunkering perspective, for LNG itself, it took us eight years. Eight years, 20 ports before the standards have come up and before it, there is an infrastructure readily available um, around the different parts of the world. So if you are talking about ammonia, talking about hydrogen, it will take some years before the, not just the ship, but also the port infrastructure bunkering. And as what Bo mentioned, the availability of the, the energy source. So in a way, um, if we don't take the first step and you don't learn along the way, you never know what other options may open up for, for, for ourselves. So LNG may be not perfect, but perhaps if we move into bio LNG, and that could give us some insights into biomethane, biomethanol, biodiesel. Why not, right? Um, as we search for that ideal uh, solution. Uh, I think um, for Singapore, we also take the same position as Bo in the sense that we believe that in the transition, it could be a multi-fuel transition. It will not be a one silver bullet. And therefore, as uh, a port and with the infrastructure and as well as for energy companies, we have to all be ready on potentially provision of these options to the shipping companies, to the whole global supply chain. If not, um, one part of it is going to be handicapped. 
Maybe I can add to this as well. I fully agree. I, I don't think we can talk about uh, LNG as a yes or a no. It's, uh, it, we can talk about it in, in the short and medium term and in the long term. And I do, I do believe that if, if you go the LNG route, then you know uh, now there's been a lot of discussions about uh, the caveats, the risks in that. So you need to be aware of your supply chain of LNG. You need to be aware of how you manage the LNG on board the ships. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I mean that is pretty well uh, documented, and and that should be managed. And then, of course, the big question a bit is about the long term perspective. What do you do long term? Are you going the biomethane way? Then, in that case, well, you need to make sure that you can actually manage that supply chain, etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So it's a much more nuanced discussion than just a yes or no. On an individual company basis, of course, it might be a yes or a no because you need to make decisions and you need to have a plan or a strategy. But I think at least for us looking at the bigger uh, picture for the shipping sector, it's, it's not a yes and a no. Uh, so so that's, a, that's a super interesting discussion. And I think a report like the one from the World Bank is, is very good in providing perspective and insights into, into those different perspectives. So uh, yes, absolutely. We're looking at, back to your question, I think we're looking at an extremely uh, exciting future and uh, the requests we are getting from outside is very much uh, about both ship owners wanting to upgrade their fleets and asking the questions, if I'm going to put substantial upgrade into my ship, what kind of multi-fuel capability optionality should I build in? And certainly if you're building a new ship, what kind of fuel should I prepare for uh, in the future? So, uh, so that's, uh, I do believe we will see a, a, a fleet, a new uh, series of ships coming out now where we will see very concretely owners, investors having thought about how to prepare for this transition and, and the road ahead with methanol, with ammonia eventually, with uh, various other kinds of fuels. So. Andres, and before I move on, would you like to yeah, add to it? I, yes, uh, because I, I agree very much with, with, with what's been said by, by all my three partners in the panel here, that it's not a, it's, it's not a yes or no, it's not black and white and, on LNG, but uh, personally, I, I, I would have the concern because if you're retrofitting or you're building, it's, it's a quite huge investment, and that means that you we're looking at a very long time frame, so you need to consider the long-term perspective on it. Having said all that, I would say also that since the, the original question here was technology, that if we, are, if we, if we see LNG as a, as, as a measure now that will reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, then one should also consider all the other things that can be done. I think Bo uh, being one of the key drivers on the triple E ships, I mean, we saw a multitude of, uh, of, uh, of measures. You could, have, you could work with the hull form, you can work with the propeller, the painting, the heat recovery. And also, and this is where I think digitalization have to come into the equation because you can have a much better navigational uh, planning and, and, and operation control that where you can maybe save five, 10%. Uh, so there's a, there's, there's a whole bucket of measures that you can actually bring into play. And, and I think that if, if, if we are so keen on discussing LNG, then I think we should be equally as keen on discussing all the other things. And that's what I really, really look forward to, not only hearing about the future fuel that Bo and, and, and also the decarbonization center in Singapore will elaborate on in, in the near future, but also on all the other measures that can be brought into to play. Because I think a lot of people in the maritime domain are simply not aware of the, of the low hanging fruits that are there. Thank you. As, as, uh, can I tie this discussion into another question from the audience? Um, which is a near-term, long-term question, because yeah. I think, you know, it's a question about carbon taxes and how much should we tax and, and you know, what's the right number, a few dollars, it doesn't seem like enough. Yeah. And I think it's relevant to what we've just been discussing because, um, again, it's the question of, do you want the perfect or do you want to start the journey and be good enough? And if you want the perfect immediately, you need to have $300 per ton of CO2 because that equalizes ammonia with fuel, uh, with oil rather. And so, you know, but you're never going to get $300 per ton uh, to get through a global regulator or any individual country because it's going to make them completely uncompetitive and you'll have so many people pushing back. Um, 
Paris Agreement, um, IMF, others say we need to be maybe at $75 per ton of CO2 by 2030. So that's another benchmark. But if you say $75 per ton tomorrow, either unilaterally as a country or, or globally, you're not going to get there because it's, again, too much to ask of the industry or too uncompetitive in one go. And then people say, what is this ridiculous proposal, you know, just a few dollars that the industry is saying, you know, two dollars per ton of bunkers, which is 70 cents, by the way, per, per ton of CO2. And my view on this is, you know what, get started and let it be 70 cents. Let it be a dollar or two dollars. Let's test the system because very quickly we're talking billions of dollars. You know, if you, if you put $75 per ton on tomorrow, you're going to have $70 billion a year that you need to do something with all of a sudden. And do we really want to start there? So my feeling is don't confuse where we want to end up in the long term with what we need to do today. And what we need to do today is start with small steps and test the systems. I would like to add to that. So I think this is a tremendous conversation because it's really, I mean, we're talking a lot about sort of the, uh, the valley on the other side of the mountain, right? It's green. We can run on completely clean fuels, et cetera, et cetera. And we can imagine how that is going to work. But it's really getting over there. That's the difficult part, right? It, the past to, we have to pass maybe so, you know, high and steep that we'll never get over there. So it's exactly what Andreas is uh, saying here about finding those small steps that takes us along the way. And I think uh, what we heard Lehun say earlier about the domestic developments is a very important step in that direction. A public engagement, Andreas mentioned it also, public engagement, we see domestic transportation starting to decarbonize. So that's an important step on that journey. And then I think, and I would really like to hear also your view on that, uh, Andreas S., on how do we see the commercial drive also starting to actually finance that first step? Can we make the charterers, can we make the end customer actually pay? And I know you can't take turn a whole business, like, for example, your group overnight into that, but maybe you can find pockets where customers are actually willing to pay so you can start to drop in fuels or start to run some of your ships on, on, on zero carbon fuels. How do you see that uh, opportunity? So I think that that shift is starting to happen and we've got lots of examples. I mean, we, we've ordered two LNG fuel tankers, which are sort of underwritten on a long-term charter by one of the big oil companies. We heard this week from the BHPs from Anglo-American who are underwriting um, ships uh, or charters for ships with new fuel. And, and most of these are LNG, by the way, because alternatives don't exist. But when the alternatives start to become viable, I think we'll see charters do, taking, taking steps. Um, you know, it's, th there's no exact answer because some of this is going to be slightly more expensive. It's going to take that societal shift or pressure that we started this conversation with in order to make it happen. And maybe one way of thinking of it is if everybody can take a little bit of pain, uh, then the system can absorb quite a lot of pain. You know, so, yeah. So to that point, there's a question that, um, that, that came out, right? Does it mean that we will be heading into a much higher shipping cost environment going forward if everybody down the supply chain will take a little bit of a hit? What's your view on that? Yeah, so people have done calculations on what it does for a pair of shoes. You know, if you increase and put carbon taxes, I don't know what the exact numbers is because we're, are because we're not in containers, but it's very small. We've done the calculation for oil. So if you put on a $33 per ton of CO2 levy, which is, you know, in the range of what I was talking about, sort of $2 to $75 or whatever, $33 per ton of CO2, and you charge it on a large product tanker um, and you assume the worst case, which is it goes in two directions and so on and so forth. You take a very conservative case. It ends up with something like 0 0.002 cents per liter at the pump. And so, yes, consumers may have to pay a little bit more, 
but it's not going to be too painful for them. Customers may end up paying a little bit more for the freight. Shipping companies may pay a little bit more if they have to retrofit ships or do things. But again, you know, I think that the system can can handle this. Um, even EXI, the last example I give on this is, you know, we talk about ships having to derate and slow down in 2023. So we did the calculation on one of our fleets and it looks like some of our ships will have to slow down by one knot from maximum speed, but we never go maximum speed anyway. So is it going to be a huge imposition on, on us um, to meet this new kind of cap and so on? Maybe it's not too painful. Um, but baby steps is, is critical because I think all human progress is built on incremental steps. And so don't, don't try to make the leap you know, all the way into the future. Take baby steps. Well, as we always say, sustainability is a journey, not a final destination. And well, we are all in this journey together. So uh, there's a, a well-liked question. So I want to ask this to uh, Lei Hung. It's around the, uh, the newly established, or what will be the decarbonization center in Singapore. The question is, how will Center for Zero Carbon Shipping, Center for Zero Carbon Shipping Center, Singapore's new decarbonization center and other initiatives go about avoiding overlaps and duplication efforts? Uh, you know, Esther, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good question because uh, when we were setting up the center or thinking of setting up center, taking the recommendations from the IEP, um, I think the question we ask ourselves is perhaps not overlaps because I think when you, this is the stage where you actually do want flowers to bloom, right? Um, and um, I think what is key is that we do um, come together and exchange information. We have players who are willing to come together, who's able to share the experience. And more importantly, is that there is a common denominator, which is globally needed. Safety standards, machine uh, engine uh, specification standards, bunkering standards. And if we could collaborate to get such fundamentals or foundations of some of the standards true, then at least we have moved forward a step. Then, of course, from a company perspective, uh, when we collaborate together, there will be issues of IP that we need to sort it out. But fundamentally, if indeed, um, let's say one day, right, methanol or ammonia is going to be the engine that's commercially viable, there will be so there will be other specifications which companies can have an edge, but there will be certain basics that companies need to exchange information. And that is, I think, should form the basis of collaboration uh, between what um, Singapore, uh, the, the uh, decarbonization centre that we have with other centres. And actually, um, I just want to also raise that at the IMO level, which Andres and can also elaborate a little bit more, there is also this next-gen initiative, which uh, IMO Secretariat is spearheading, where we actually do want um, to bring forward willing partners to share their experiences and to provide potential solutions. And this is actually the best way to help SMEs, you know, actually, if you, we are talking about supporting and helping SMEs, to also help them leapfrog in terms of their knowledge. Um, then second Secondly, it's also about um, uh, how to come together even on the issues of carbon levy or mandatory contribution as what the industry uh, has, has proposed. Um, it's something which uh, at the member state level between Denmark and Singapore, we also co-sponsored papers together to try to bring certain of these common denominators up. Uh, because if not, then we are just all waiting and seeing, uh, worried about duplication, not sure whether this can work, and then nothing will really work. Yeah. So, oh, Bo, are you worried about duplication and a bit of overlap? No, I, I love it. I think it's great. I, I really love to see this initiative. We were born with the mindset of, uh, of collaboration. And, and I think we have, we have to realize that we don't have a market today for zero carbon shipping. It doesn't exist. We have 300 million tons of fuel a year that needs to be replaced. And, and, and if we fall into this pitfall of starting competing at this stage, we will never get there. You know, so, so from the very beginning, we've tried to make this a kind of a naive IP free zone, if you will. You have to be very much aware of background IP and IP and all of that. But if you start the conversation with that, you just start on the wrong ground, I think. So, uh, so we're working from the idea that now we're in the pre-competitive stage. We need to establish exactly like Lehun said, the standards, the confidence that we can decarbonize, uh, the explanation why and how it's a good investment to start going into this. 
putting steel in the ground and ships in the water, you know, to, we have to get it going. We don't, we're not nowhere near the situation where investors, uh, you know, feel confident about going into this. So there's so much that needs to be in place in order to get there. And I mean, the way we are very practically would like to work with this is to establish a work program where we develop, you know, positions, we develop new standards, we develop uh, this uh, and that uh, understanding of how do we get there and what are the risks and the barriers to get there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with the Singapore Centre, some of those topics I'm sure you would also identify and we would want to collaborate very concretely on, for example, how do you do life cycle analysis of uh, LNG now as we spoke about that, you know, and how do you measure it? How do you mitigate the risks related to ammonia, say. Uh, so we ha- already have a long list of topics and there's so much scope in this that even if we'll be a hundred people, there's, you know, there's no way we can solve this alone. So I, I think the opportunity is really great to, to get more. Uh, uh, actually, when one of the journalists asked me this question yesterday about duplication, I said, you know, when your goal is to save the planet from climate change, a little bit of duplication is okay. <laughs> yeah. no, you, if, in fact uh, my, my, my dream will be that for the decarbonize, the two decarbonization centers to come together and you will give Andreas Ann and myself something that we can surface up to IMO and it gets adopted as international centers and that will be the best result we can actually achieve for this world yeah, let's do it fantastic <laughs> well we have some more concrete and actions following this, uh, following this uh, panel discussion very good. But if I, if I just may say, I think that if, again, for as government representative, I think both Lee Hoon and, and myself, we need to really, really be very uh, conscious about that. It, we need to facilitate the, the knowledge sharing across borders, both public, private, but also internationally, because as Bo was indicating, nobody have the solution alone. Hmm. Uh, so if, if everybody sits with their own and 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 are dreaming of the big uh, sort of commercial competitive advantage here, it's it's then nothing is going to fly. And I agree very much with what Andreas has said. You know, if we, we if, when we talk about saving the planet, so who minds duplication on the uh, on the opposite? I mean, we should we should have everybody working in the same direction. So. And are you also working with other sector centers, uh, sector research centers? But here yes. we're talking about... Oh, you, you're, talk, you're talking to me, right? Yes? Uh, or to... Uh... Well, oh, we haven't okay. set up... We haven't, I mean, we only announced our centre this week, so I'll, I'll hold back from making any comments. <laughs> oh, you've been up and running for a while. Yeah. You should answer this one. <laughs> indeed, we are indeed. So we have a number of uh, partners that are working, I would say, both in the shipping space, but you asked about other sectors, and I think particularly the energy space, is extremely important. So, so we have established, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, forecasting future energies and so on is extremely important to understand how shipping fits into that context of the global energy mix changing. That's one thing. And then the other thing is the whole sustainability agenda, understanding how, do, how does shipping actually fit into uh, the bigger sustainability agenda? How do we measure ourselves? How do we set targets, etc.? So, uh, so here we have, for example, established a partnership with the Environmental Defense Fund, just to mention one. But uh, so, so that's really the idea that uh, we, we certainly need to reach out. And you can say also, when it comes to the the actual technologies and the solutions, we will also find technologies in other sectors, you know, that we can use in shipping, whether it's fuel cells being developed for trains and automotives or whether it's, uh, you know, tanking and storage systems being developed for land-based operations, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's so much learning. There's so much going on in the world around us. So we have to be open. Can I, can I actually use that as a jumping off point for <clears throat> technology? Because I mentioned it earlier. I see there's a question about it from people listening in. Thank you. Um, and Andreas earlier uh, mentioned about you know, all the different solutions we can apply to operational improvement. So I think, you know, we talk a lot about these two big trends, digitalization, decarbonization. Digitalization is actually a means to an end. I mean, I don't think we wake up in the morning and our ambition in life is to digitalize. You know, (laughs) our ambition is to create better living standards for people around the world and to do it without destroying the planet. 
Uh, you know, that's the end goal. And digital is one of the means. But it's a very powerful means that we shouldn't underestimate. And I just wanted to give a little bit of an example. You know, we, we've invested in this um, great platform. There are many platforms out there, but the one we're, we're working with is called Alpha Ori. And it collects the data we need to manage fuel, to manage emissions, to manage reporting. So it comes back to this reporting point that we made earlier. Why do we like it? Well, first of all, it's something that's available today. So rather than dreaming about what the future may look like, you make a modest investment today, and then you have 5,000 sensors on board your ships, which tell you everything that's going on. We like it because you get what you measure. And not only do you know how much fuel you're consuming and how your engine is performing, but the magic is actually when the computer starts to match up and compare different inputs. So for instance, when fuel consumption goes up, you need to know, is it because the weather and the sea state has changed or is it because your operating parameters have changed? Is it because of this? Is it because of that? So you need to marry the data together and then you get these great insights. And you know, my third observation on technology, people I think worry about computers taking over from human judgment, but I really believe you can have the best of both. I mean, we now have guidance to our captains on how to reduce consumption turn by turn. You know, on a voyage, they're being told exactly, you want to move, you know, X degrees this way, you want to move a little bit this way because you can optimize for currents and weather and improve your consumption. Um, we let ways guide us in traffic even when we know the route. You know, we use wearables to tell us how our body is doing even when we know how we feel. And so, you know, let's use technology to give us that extra edge and also to reduce emissions and to have robust reporting at the end of it. That, that I think, is a great opportunity. Is there anyone else, Andreas, and would you like to add to that on the use of technology? No, I, I would say that it, uh, I think that, but, but we could have a, a full day seminar on a panel discussion on, on I think, in particular, the digitalization. To me, I think it's two big challenges that we're facing uh, zero, zero emission uh, shipping, which is the end goal. And then I very much agree, then digitalization, which is a tool to, to get a lot of benefit better safety, better security, better efficiency, uh, zero emission shipping. And to be honest, and that could be a pitch for a future panel discussion, shipping is nowhere near embracing digitalization. I mean, we only see pilot projects moving, but there's so much cultural reluctance built into us. So we, we I mean, the, the, I think many, many, many people and rest would, would say what you just mentioned, that you're telling the caption how to and when to. I mean, that is, I mean, it's, it's it's beyond <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he yeah. has to still stay in charge of course and you have to make sure you have a culture where he knows he's in charge and he's not going to let a computer tell him to get stuck in a canal or something <laughs> but that's my point i think that we have just seen the beginning of artificial uh, artificial intelligence uh, putting into much better decision making and and i think that that is definitely part of the equation and i hope also that both the center in singapore and both center and others will will also start looking at that. How can, how can better decision-making, uh, use of big data, et cetera, how can that help us uh, uh, in, in, in achieving zero emission shipping? One, one other just very quick point on this, though, is it also needs collaboration. We keep talking about collaboration for decarbonization. You can't get enough data uh, in your data lake, in your system, in your computer to make sense of stuff unless you collaborate and you have multiple companies. I mean, how many transactions does Amazon process in a day, you know, or Apple Store, you know, music requests or Spotify, whatever it is, you know, their algorithms are built on volume. And in shipping, even if you're running a fleet with a thousand ships, you don't really have enough data points to make sense. So, that's where we need to create these big data lakes with many companies participating, and then we're going to get all these great insights out of it. And then your point too is, uh, 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 um, I would say one of the barriers is that the the, the reluctance of data sharing in, in the industry. But again, we can take that on a later panel, maybe next year. Andrea, so. Absolutely. I think uh, these two topics, digitalization and decarbonization, has been central throughout this conference, hasn't it? 
Sorry, Bo, you were going to say, jump in. With yeah, no, I, I fully agree. And, and I think, uh, you know, we're looking at, with this uh, green transition over the next two or three decades, we have to realize that energy efficiency will need to come up enormously. So uh, digital and technology in general is going to play a key role in that. And this is just something that, I mean, we will have to keep, and I think it will to some extent happen naturally, at least amongst the big companies that are able to, to have a scale on this. Um, but there is still a tremendous opportunity in driving energy or efficiencies up in general, not only in uh, the engine room and the navigation, but also in the way that you plan the overall logistics. So this is certainly a part of the solution and digital is gonna play a key role uh, in that. The other thing that uh, Andreas has mentioned also is uh, in the documentation part. And it's just, we cannot stress enough how important it is to have robust documentation and a system where you cannot basically cheat because you know in the future the price differential between the black fuels and the green fuels is going to be huge and at the end of the day you can't tell on a methanol molecule where it comes from if you just look at the molecule in the port you know so there needs to be a very robust a documentation system behind all of this. So this is really one of the key enablers. And, and here we can expect that digital can really play an important role also. Absolutely, that, and that increasing demand on transparency and disclosure uh, across all in sustainability is of, of absolute cruciality. And you're, we're gonna see that coming from certainly the investors, but also the customers and the general public demanding uh, more accurate, and sound data to be presented. Um, so we're can I, coming up. To, oh, sorry, uh, Lehun. So I just add quick two points. I think I, 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 I mean, from Singapore, we really have uh, two dreams. No, the first is really what we coined as global uh, digital ocean. Really um, the idea where port to port we are connected so that at least we know when the ship is leaving another port and we can time all our marine services when the ship arrives so that the ship knows whether you can slow steam, fast steam, at what speed you can go. And that will increase the carbon efficiency. Second dream really is about um, data connectivity where it is, uh, we no longer just track ship to ship, port to port, but goods to goods. So from the fact that it leaves the factories all the way to the home, um, that we have some form of uh, data that we are able to track. And that will be really what the consumer is asking and it will be looking at. So I think consumer demand will drive that. Um, and um, yeah, maybe like what uh, both Andreas has said, uh, it, it probably warrants another few hours of discussion mm -hmm. on how we can achieve that. Yeah. Okay. Well, this ties, uh, you, you, you spoke of dreams, so this ties into a dream of GCNS, which is, uh, you know, we are asking everybody, all individuals, companies, to take concrete steps, big or small, and I think all of you have said that, just start somewhere, right, to help build a healthier and more sustainable uh, world. So I would like to round off the discussion today by asking, you know, one final question to our panelists, and this is, um, in your day to day, what is that one decisive action that you are doing to help build a more sustainable future? So I will start with uh, Bo. Oh, with me first? Okay. In my day-to-day, <laughs> -day, you mean private life, right? Not uh, We're not talking work now. Yeah, your personal capacity. What are you doing to championing a more sustainable future? So if we don't talk work, then I would say right now, uh, I'm looking at uh, replacing my car. I want to have an electric car. But then, of course, I, you know, my wife is working on, on life cycle analysis. And so we started debating if you buy an electric car, is that really the right step forward? And how do you do it? And what do you need? You know, do we need to change um, supply of uh, energy, which we do, so we'll do that. And we'll also look a little bit into the, the life cycle, the footprint of the car. So I think that's uh, the big thing on my mind right now. But I'm actually trying not to take the car. I take the train every day, which is powered by something like 70% wind power uh, electricity. So I think that's my little everyday step uh, towards uh, decarbonization. Very nice. Thank you. Andreas, uh, Andreas N. Well, uh, I have a 
when we are post corona i will get back to a rhythm where i drive 240 kilometers per day and of course then the, the fuel consumption is on my mind here but i can say that i've actually taken the step that i've just ordered a new car uh, it's not an electric car because we still have we face challenges here still with infrastructure so it can I cannot be sure that I can charge uh, where I live. So I have uh, both, uh, I've ordered a hybrid car, which I look very much forward. And that will definitely, uh, uh, that will really reduce uh, my impact on the greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas footprint, yeah. Very nice. And Andreas S? Yeah, so actually I, I <laughs> kind of by weird coincidence, that was going to be my answer, which is, <laughs> which is true, by the way, I'm switching to an electric car. That's a fact. But since that's already been taken by others, um, I'm telling my son to close his door to save air conditioning about 20 times a day, every <laughs> day. <laughs> that's my commitment to the planet. <laughs> Very good. And then finally, Lehum. Um, two things I've uh, we've done every Sunday morning afternoon no cars with the whole family we'll take the bicycle out we'll cycle 20 to 30 kilometers to eat lunch have tea and then cycle back home so and second um, when we reach home in the afternoon I make them watch documentaries given my media background and they watch documentaries which shows the adverse consequences of what human is doing to earth including for example recently in Netflix Cisperacy so I think we just need to instill the next generation as well <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm with you on the cycling, and I also recently saw uh, Seaspiracy and is definitely cutting down on the consumption of fish. <laughs> okay, very, very good. Well, um, I will then just round off with a couple key points, um, but really, uh, you, you've said it all, but, um, well, but taking um, from everyone's uh, comments here, you know, we're seeing that there is that increasing pressure from stakeholders, from consumers, investors, for the industry to address climate change. Now, this needs to be combined with coordinated industry efforts and investments in R&D to help accelerate the pace of change. And we talked a lot about partnership, how it is absolutely critical to realize the goals for sustainable shipping. And this means collaboration, not only within the shipping industry itself, but also across the broader maritime ecosystem and with other sectors. Now, when we think about the risk from decarbonization, we do also need to break this big, massive challenge into smaller parts, right? Smaller bite side risks, which are more manageable. You know, the UN uh, sec, uh, sec Gen Antonio Guterres has said climate change is the biggest threat to the humans have ever faced. No one can take it alone, so we need to collaborate to accelerate. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank a panel for this very lively conversation. We've you know, moved around in different directions, but end at the, you know, the one final spot, which is we need to partner, we need to collaborate. We want to have that will, desire to move to that end goal. I thank you very much for your insight. I also want to thank the audience for your participation and questions. I wish everyone a very fruitful maritime week and I will return the floor back to M Ambassador Andy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther, for taking us through that uh, exciting discussion and thank you to the excellent panel. I knew this would be good, but this was really, really good. So thank you so much. Extremely lively. I have pages and pages of notes of all the basic stuff you said so I won't go into try even try to summarize it I'll just paraphrase a little bit you said we are going to take baby steps to get to the green pastures on the other side we're saving the planet um, and we have to create now the standards and confidence that we can decarbonize and how fantastic that we soon have two centers that can work together in partnership to make sure we get there we have some committed maritime authorities that will take the, the ideas forward uh, to the global level and make sure that we all have these uh, standards and regulations and accountability frameworks and all that we need uh, to get to the right place. So thank you so much. That was an amazing debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, thank Ambassador Sandra. And I think I just wanted to, to share some closing remarks also. On behalf of SG Innovate, we would like to thank um, all of our panelists for taking the time off your busy schedules to join us for today's lively discussion. And I cannot echo enough what, what Ambassador Sandra as well as what Esther has summed up very nicely. And I also like to extend our thanks to our attendees for staying um, till the end of our session. And I hope that despite the time constraint that we have managed to 
to uncover some valuable insights on our shift towards decarbonization and green transitions. Lastly, I hope um, everyone can have a nice evening or afternoon, wherever you're tuning from. And thank you so much for joining us. For the speakers, could I request that we stay back for a few more minutes so that we can take a panel screenshot since Lei Hun uh, joined